Thank you, Paul. A recovering addict is probably an apt description for that. It's a 35-year addiction to NOAA. Um, so I've been asked to talk a little bit about uh, some uh, some alternative concepts and sustainability and some emerging opportunities uh, through some quantitative tools and, and different approaches to the notion of not only the general panoply of ecosystem services, but also specifically with some fisheries applications. So what I'll do is um, talk uh, a little bit about uh, sustainability in ecosystems uh, and the nexus of what I call the uh, the water environment and food supply uh, tri triad. Uh, secondly, I want to uh, talk a little bit more about life cycle analysis, uh, uh, a definition, some general applications that many of us are quite familiar with, even though we don't call it life cycle analysis, and then some fishery related applications. Um, talk a little bit about operational definitions uh, of sustainability for fisheries, and this uh, follows up on Cynthia Jones's talk yesterday. Uh, both some some progress, some issues, and some I call them opportunities. Uh, uh, they're probably problems, but that's um, another way to talk about them. And then um, finally, a little bit about multidisciplinary uh, perspectives and in, in what we're trying to do. So, in terms of this uh, tri great triad here, um, when we look at you know the uh, entirety of the the environment ecosystem. Uh, sets of issues here. They're wrapped up in you know, societal well-being, well um, human outcomes, uh, as well as um, our general preparedness for uh, environmental catastrophe. And so you can align much of what we're trying to do on this triad of, of uh, people at the, at the nexus and uh, happy and safe and uh, sustainable uh, uses um, for people. Uh, the environment, that is uh, an environment that's productive and safe. Um, and the whole notion of food production, that is, uh, you know, what is it that uh, we're extracting from the environment, both in terms of uh, people, sustaining people, but also, you know, uh, the uh, feedback loops that we get from all of the points along this triad uh, in terms of the sustainability at any other nexus point in the triad. And so, you know, much of what we're talking about in all of this sustainability um, plays off of the feedback loops that we're actually talking about. And, it, you know, because there are so many varied um, ecosystem services that we're trying to extract um, and maintain at the same time, uh, it really does come down to, you know, what are the, what is the currency that we're trying to actually um, uh, establish when we, we talk about ecosystem services production as well as sustainability. So in terms of um, life cycle analysis, uh, a good definition is life cycle analysis is an environmental assessment tool to quantify environmental impact throughout the entire life cycle of a product or process. Um, the, in, in this sense, life cycle means you know, from the raw material, extraction, production phases, transportation phases, all the way up to uh, waste treatment that is basically uh, cradle to grave. Um, I would uh, recommend a book called Cradle to Cradle, which is you know, one of the more popular uh, books that talks about this whole life cycle concept. Um, its history is in industrial process control, a um, lot to do with you know, the uh, early beings of recycling as not necessarily an issue, but uh, a new opportunity for uh, enhancing incomes from, from product, um, product sourcing and, and, and use. Uh, it has a, a long history in looking at uh, things like packaging control and other things, um, and only recently has been applied to more ecological problems. In particular, um, one can think about life cycle analysis as, as far as some of the general issues that we're dealing with. Um, a good one is the um, uh, looking at biofuels. Um, that is, you know, what is the input of, uh, of uh, fossil fuels versus the output of uh, fuel? And of course, you know, the disappointing part about corn, uh, corn ethanol production in the United States is it's just about one to one. Um, those are the types of things that life cycle analysis does. Um, uh, obviously, one can look at different sourcing, for example, a Brazilian uh, exercise in, in, uh, in biofuel production and come up with a different answer. And so the notion that one can look at, you know, um, these social issues, you know, from an engineering point of view in terms of, of, of the outcomes is important. Um, obviously, transportation systems alternatives um, have a heavy uh, energy component to them. You know, what is the, the, um, the energy um, uh, energy used per travel mile, et cetera, and one can come up with a good justification for public transportation in certain locales. Uh, the human health outcomes in a whole relation 
a uh, whole um, variety of different settings. Uh, and then, of course, um, greenhouse gas production and the whole notion of carbon footprints uh, as it relates to not only a variety of products that, that we have, but also uh, looking at offsets for uh, greenhouse gases. So those are some familiar examples. Um, and when we look at um, all of those uh, life cycle analyses, they do have a currency. That is, what is it we're trying to uh, look at the life cycle relative to? Uh, and just some of the classes are obviously energy consumption and production, um, things like uh, toxic um, and hazardous waste production. Uh, that is, you know, getting rid of the, the toxic byproducts of many of the process controls we have. Um, food production and consumption, that is, you know, are we uh, netting out, you know, positive food production in those industries that we're try trying to look at. Um, water consumption and production uh, is a very, very important aspect for many of the industries that we're dealing with now. Um, economics, that is, both from the consumer and the producer side, um, do things make logical sense when we add up the, the dollars and cents uh, for the things that we're trying to achieve. Uh, human mortality and well-being, of course, those are pretty much the bottom lines for almost anything that we're, we're doing. Uh, the carbon footprint issues, and, and of course, uh, natural resource sustainability. And that is when we're confronted with a variety of uh, alternatives, you know, both in specific industries and generally, do they result in net sustainability, improvement of sustainability, or decline? Here's, um, here's one example that I think <clears throat> is really um, uh, perhaps at um, the heart of, you know, heart of, um, what we're uh, trying to achieve, uh, looking at the nexus between um, uh, health-related issues and ecosystem services. And this is the whole notion of uh, improving cardiac outcomes for people by um, dietary consumption. And this is a really great analysis by uh, Darish Mozaferi and his colleagues, looking at um, the, the intake of um, basically two components of omega-3 fatty acids versus the, um, the um, the decline in uh, cardiac um, um, uh, outcomes. And there seems to be, in, in their uh, meta-analysis, uh, a breaking point at about 500 milligrams of both of these two components um, per, per week in terms of um, positive outcomes for people. So that's a, obviously a, an important aspect of, of this. And a, as Cynthia pointed out, this has some this has some repercussions when we look at the outcomes for ecosystems in the supply chain. Um, but that's, of course, balanced off against uh, what we call the seafood dilemma, and that is uh, greater consumption of seafood obviously is, you know, has these heart uh, health benefits, both in heart and other aspects, but also, uh, depending on who you are and what you consume, you can also be taking a toxic load of mercury, PCBs, and dioxins. And so this notion of doing a life cycle analysis of um, of, of seafood consumption from diff two different perspectives. You know, the perspective of improved outcomes, health outcomes, and actually toxic, you know, uh, outcomes is an important one. And one is highly controversial. And when I was at the National Marine Fishery Service, we sponsored a number of major studies by the academies looking at the, the trade-offs and balances of these outcomes. Now, interesting thing is, of course, it depends on what you eat. You know, if you eat anchovies and a lot of them, you can get what you need from very small dose. If you eat cod, you have to eat a heck of a lot in order to get what you want. And, and of course, so that mix of seafood has a lot of feedbacks in terms of the, uh, the outcomes for, for the natural resource sustainability. The interesting thing about this was, um, in, in looking at this thing, um, there was a very positive uh, ratio to uh, positive outcomes versus toxic uh, inputs, uh, about a 300 to 1 ratio of, of improved cardiac outcome versus uh, uh, greater numbers of deaths for things like mercury toxicity and things. And so that's the good news, at least for the human outcomes. The bad news is, you know, it's putting a lot more uh, pressure on natural resource supply. Um, this, these are some calculations that uh, Cynthia went across uh, over. Um, clearly, under any of these scenarios of uh, two meals a week, either three and a half ounces or six ounces, um, we don't have enough um, uh, productivity in the ocean to sustain this, both nationally and internationally. And so um, we have, uh, in a sense, conflicting national goals or international goals in terms of um, you know trying to get people to eat more fish and then not having enough fish to actually eat. Th therein lies, I think, uh, some of the uh, hope of, uh, of looking at um, aquaculture uh, to supply this, uh, this unmet balance. 
Um, there are other uh, examples of life cycle analysis applied to fisheries, and this is a really good um, w example of looking at multiple dimensions of sustainability uh, and the metrics um, for life cycle analysis. And this happens to be for Danish fishery products. And Danish fisheries are a really interesting case study because they include both uh, human consumption fisheries and, um, believe it or not, uh, Denmark is a major uh, producer of mink. mink. And so they use a lot of their fishery products to feed the mink before they take the mink. Uh, and so, so there's lots of interesting aspects to this. Um, these are some of the uh, categories. And you can see these are water quality and toxicity uh, categories here. So uh, basically, um, at, if you look at the whole fishing and, and fishery industry process, you've got the, the catching part, the auctions of the fish, the processing, the wholesaling, the transport, the retail, and basically the consumption side. And so you can look across all of these dimensions and get some kind of score in terms of um, the, the, the impacts of these various activities as it relates to the outcomes that are uh, described here. And, and so um, one can take a very sophisticated look at, at fisheries from this perspective. Um, this, here's a flow diagram, and the interesting thing about this analysis is that it also um, is not just a fisheries issue, but it also looks at alternatives um, in, ter in the marketplace in terms of like uh, substitution of soy protein, and, and you know some of the byproducts go to feed uh, um, other um, uh, other commodities like the mink, uh, as well as uh, pork products because this is used in, in sustainability. Uh, uh, um, food additives. And so one needs to look in terms of um, life cycle analysis, not only within the sector, but you know the, the sectors that are uh, codependent. Uh, this is a real interesting analysis, uh, straightforward, of uh, energy costs per ton under, uh, of different fishing methods. And what we're starting to see now, because of the high cost of energy in fisheries, uh, people are really looking at uh, going back to less uh, energy costly solutions per ton. And you can see that um, some of these, um, some of these um, methods, which weren't sustainable to begin with, you know, in terms of the natural resource outcomes, are certainly not sustainable in terms of the uh, energy costs uh, to do them, and so life cycle analysis is incorporating them. So I, I wanted to switch from life cycle analysis to a little bit more on fishery sustainability. Uh, just a few fun fishery facts about the United States and uh, the world. Um, obviously, world seafood production uh, is slightly under 100 million metric tons per year. It's static. Um, aquaculture is increasing as a fraction. Um, there's a crossover point, I think. Uh, Kevin's probably probably knows what that is. I, I don't. But at some point, we'll be producing more in aquaculture than wild fisheries are producing. Uh, the U.S. Uh, is, depending on the year that you have, the U.S. is uh, either um, third or fourth um, in terms of landings. We're also, um, depending on the year, either first or second in fishery imports in the world with Japan and the United States kind of vying for the top spot there. Uh, recreational fisheries are another important aspect. Um, obviously, the the trade deficit that we have in imported seafood is enormous. It's about it's about um, just shy of 28 billion dollars per year. Half of it's edible, so-called edible, and half of it's um, basically a fish meal for a whole variety of products. And so, there's an enormous um, uh, global aspect to this. Um, th this is basically the, uh, the, the graphic of, of the outcomes, and you can see capture fisheries are flat. Aquaculture production is going up uh, at some point. Um, this, this space will be more than this space. Um, uh, interestingly, um, how do um, there's a, a, an important move afoot. Uh, in uh, sustainability circles and particularly in fisheries to try to rank countries in terms of their compliance with the United Nations Code of Conduct for Sustainable Fishing. And it's real interesting. You can see, well, you probably can't see, but th these are basically the nations of the world lined up in terms of their uh, compliance with the Code of Conduct for the United Nations. And, and generally speaking, at least in this one uh, analysis by Tony Pitcher, a failing grade is about 40%. So you've got all the Yemen and Nigeria and, you know, um, and other North Korea over here. Um, United States, Australia, New Zealand, Norway, Iceland are really the top five on this metric. The, of course, the interesting thing is this is the United States here in this metric. This is where we get a lot of our food from. And so if you actually look at the stars of the countries 
that you know we're getting that seafood supply from, they have very poor records uh, in terms of sustainability, and so the footprint really comes back um, to haunt us and the Europeans and the Japanese. Um, so how do we define sustainability? Uh, There's a nice analogy of uh, looking at the glass half full or half empty in a big faucet. The glass half full is uh, what's the size of the stock? That is, you know, how, how close to the top of the lip are you in terms of the magnitude of the stock? And the, basically the, the valve you have is, you know, how fast are you depleting, you know, what's in there? The idea, of course, is to fill the glass up and then take, you know, whatever is coming into the glass as a, as a sustainable outcome. Um, uh, this, um, that whole concept can be um, rearticulated as this quadrant diagram. Uh, just suffice to say, this is very bad. This, this quadrant up here means the stock um, is low in terms of its total magnitude and the faucet's wide open. This is nirvana, you know, we, you know, where we got the glass full and you know, basically it's trickling out. Um, these two um, quadrants hopefully are, are um, where stocks don't go. Uh, for a very long time. This is um, a kind of a disastrous scenario where no matter what you do, you can't get the stock to actually improve, even if you stop fishing. Uh, generally speaking, they're, they're transition quadrants. And so, you know, our goal in, in the United States and elsewhere in the world now, because of the Rio declarations, is to move these stocks down into this quadrant. Um, uh, the U.S. is doing pretty well. Um, uh, this is a sustainability index that's been rising steadily um, and ha is projected to keep rising as more and more of those stocks go into the lower left-hand quadrant, which is a good thing. Um, as of September 30th, 2012, these are the st um, stocks in the United States, and there are something like 283 managed stocks um, that still need to move from the left-hand side of that diagram to the right-hand side of the diagram, so there's plenty of work to do. Um, there's 40, 43 out of those 280 stocks. And the interesting thing is we now have a track record of rebuilding those uh, many stocks. And so th this is the list of stocks that have come off the rebuilding list and are now considered sustainable. Sea scallops is a really dramatic example of this in terms of rebuilding what was a very depleted and very um, non-sustainable fishery into one that is now. Um, I, let me just skip some of this stuff. This is the sea scallop um, scenario. These are large closed areas on, uh, in uh, the New England region. This is the size of sea scallops now versus the non-sustainable use of them before. Um, these are the catches, and you can see the catches did a whole lot of, you know, sort of up and down. Uh, by reducing the mortality rates, what you've got is biomass now that's at historic high levels, and of course fishery landings, which are also at historic high levels. It's a great example. Um, one of the, I wanted to talk a little bit about the commodification, the globalization of fisheries. Um, this is a really interesting paper that uh, uh, the people at um, the Sea Around Us project at the University of British Columbia have done. So uh, what they did was they compared uh, uh, seafood um, net imports from uh, Japan, the United States, and the EU, which are the, account for the vast majority of seafood imports around the world. So this is just a uh, graphic for for the United States. So this plot is the, uh, wh where the United States actually lands its fish from. Um, this is where the imports for um, United States f um, fish come from. And this graphic is uh, how much of um, the total production worldwide is accounted for by U.S. imports. So for example, you see particularly in, um, in Oceania, you see an enormous fraction of the catch uh, in Oceania actually goes to the United States versus other outcomes. And so, so when one looks at you know, all of these, uh, these outcomes, you really have to look at not only um, the balance of, uh, of trade, but also you know, the potential protein deficits that we might be creating because of this high value export product. Uh, and this is a good example. This is the, uh, what's, what's happened in, uh, in um, EU fisheries. Um, there's an enormous, um, both EU and Japanese fisheries, efforts been transferred to Africa as these countries have tried to uh, achieve uh, sustainability in their own fisheries. And so basically you see this negative feedback loop that's being exported. Um, and, you know, we're responsible for some of this as well. Uh, in terms of global food production, uh, this, this, this is the scenario of, of, uh, of grain exports around the world, and you can see that it's enormous. Um, with this large signal of fishery imports, one has to um, look at, you know, are things like fishery imports driving the 
greater um, consumption and import of grains as alternative uh, food sources for many of these areas around the world that are protein deficient to start with. Um, there is a lot of hope. Um, obviously, some of the sustainability examples that we've, um, we've talked about, both in, uh, particularly in the United States, which tends to be a world leader in this, um, there's also a large movement afoot uh, within the consumer um, uh, realm to, um, to value um, sustainably caught products. And so what we're seeing is a major move towards these uh, so-called certification programs where basically you would have this kind of label on a food package uh, and the life cycle analysis is being done by third parties like the Marine Stewardship Council to look at um, you know, the sustainability of various fishing methods and stocks um, as a positive feedback to um, valuing sustainably caught fisheries. And as much as this is a regulatory issue for many of the, the um, nations and, and, and agencies, and it's a very difficult one to get over, the, the marketplace is actually showing some strong signals, particularly in Europe and to some extent in the United States, although 90% of Americans don't pay any attention to that kind of label. on They're, they're, they're shopping on price at Walmart. But uh, nevertheless, um, it, it's a positive factor in many um, um, areas, particularly in Europe, in terms of sustainability. Um, there are a large number of different types of measures that one can apply. Uh, interesting thing is fisheries managers basically trying to achieve sustainability with a, with a mix of these classic uh, measures. The fact that we've got things like the Marine Stewardship Council and other um, consumer-based uh, protections as well uh, is, is certainly a hopeful spot, uh, thing. Uh, one of the, um, one of the um, difficulties, of course, of this is uh, when one does a life cycle analysis of um, short-term losses and long-term gains to achieve sustainability, m often we don't include the transition costs in society, and this is a this was a public march here a couple of years ago in D.C. Um, there's a lot of pushback. Um, there, you know, conservation comes with a major cost, and it's the transition of to sustainability and the fact that many of these people are not going to be working in, in professions in order to in, achieve that sustainability. Um, the climate-related issues for fisheries and oceans are very important, and they're emerging as a series of metrics that one would want to look at in life cycle analysis, not only greenhouse gases, but other things. There's lots of really interesting, well, interesting but um, important aspects to the whole greenhouse gas and en 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 enrichment uh, scenario in terms of what it means, and looking at um, all of these aspects in life cycle analysis is important. Um, this whole issue about, um, you know, uh, are we on a kind of a doomsday scenario with fish? Uh, clearly, you know, if some of these things, you know, happen in terms of um, food production, um, there's going to be m even more demand on, on natural ecosystem services, including fish. Um, I'll skip that one. So final thoughts. Um, there's an emerging set of new tools to operationalize sustainability uh, and to aid decision making. You know, LCA is just one of them. Uh, um, clearly, the notion of quantifying our sustainability goals is important. Secondly, um, uh, one can do a life cycle analysis uh, in terms of trade-offs from many different perspectives, and sort of the key to all this is defining the perspectives that are relevant to the kinds of problems that we want to look at. It certainly requires multidisciplinary approaches, and the fact that we're being sponsored by the health uh, organization here to talk about ecosystem services is a positive thing. And last, um, economics is not the only relevant currency that we deal with. So thank you.